So parents don't think these things. <laughs> no, I did. The whole time I was I was thinking, I was like, this is a bad idea because the only only leverage I had. Um, the question of the week. What do you have the hardest time receiving instruction on? Did it just not fit him for a week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, now you'll learn. Uh, if you live fast enough, yeah. Um, so, what do you have the hardest time receiving instruction on? Anybody want to share? I think it's uh, for me is somebody telling me what to do when I already know what to do. Oh. <laughs> awesome. You <laughs> know, for me, it's pretty much people just trying to tell me how to live my life. You need to do it this way. Oh my gosh. Do you know what that made me think of is that SNL song? <laughs> I'm not a part of your system. I threw it on the ground. <laughs> Did you know that like one? My aunt and uncle were down this weekend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they think every time they come down, they have to tell us, us how to do things around their house. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Is it your favorite thing? <laughs> they stayed longer than they were. And they told us they were going to. So oh. when they finally left this one, was, yeah. Have you ever seen oh. the the Great Outdoors with Dan Aykroyd and uh, what's his name? Uh, Candy. Uh, oh, yeah. No. Yeah. No. John. Maybe John Candy. John Candy. <laughs> that sounds right. And uh, they go camping up in up in the woods, and uh, Dan Aykroyd and his kids come unannounced and yeah, stay the whole vacation. Normally they give us a couple of weeks notice. They gave us a day and a half notice. Okay, we're coming down. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. That's awesome. Uh, I know for me, um, it, it's anything that really has to do with my skills. You know what I mean? I, like one time somebody was trying to tell me how to play Happy Birthday on the guitar. I was so offended that I almost blew a fuse. I was so offended. I was like, are you joking me right now? It's okay. You'll get this. It is John Candy. John Candy? Um, and then another thing that, that I think I have a really hard time receiving instruction on is when it's something to do with my authority. You know, like, my somebody tries to tell me how to parent or me how to, how to be a good husband. Like, when they... I'm okay with input, but when people, like, do it in, like, that, you know, that, that way that people, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I need to tell you because you can't figure this out on your own, and my way is the right way. It's like, oh, 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 but, yeah. Anybody else? Grace, did you have anything? goes along with what um, you were saying, like, say somebody gave me a specific project to work on, and then they come in and micromanage it, that's, I think that, I mean, like, if someone's given input on what I should do, I'm perfectly fine with that, but if they start coming in and micromanaging every single thing I do, that, that. And how does that make you feel, Gracie? <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> has that happened before, Gracie? It has happened. I think mostly for me, it's not so much what do I have the hardest time receiving instruction on, but who from. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's just people I'm like, I stopped listening five minutes ago. So. And you weren't even talking five minutes ago, so that should tell you something. <laughs> Zach, did you want to say anything? Yeah, it's basically just... A lot of people who already, the stuff that I already know, and they're already telling their you. input, like, really, you know this? That's these. awesome. Uh, that just gets otherwise again. <laughs> Another thing is when you're already doing something somebody told you to do, and then they just keep on you. Oh my yeah, gosh. Like, that can't you see you know, yeah. already doing it? In construction, we had that a lot. Do this, okay. Okay, so you're doing it, and until you do it again, it's like I'm doing it already. But ah, uh, what, what, mm, uh, mm. <laughs> yeah. When you do it, and then it's not good enough. <laughs> well, I think for me, it is when they buy something, they have to go by the instruction book. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> We're, we're reading out of uh, Proverbs 11 and 12 tonight. 
And, uh, <laughs> I think if we're honest, um, we, like, as we have been, you know, uh, I, I, th there's always something that, that we're going to have a hard time receiving instruction on. And, uh, it's just part of life. Yeah. And it's a good thing that we know are these weaknesses, you know, it, it's, I think it's worse to not know what you, what you, what you need to work on, you know, so. <laughs> Anyways, so um, for the next chapters throughout the book until we reach about, well, probably somewhere around the end, uh, maybe for the rest of the book, uh, we're just pretty much going to go rapidly through verse by, by verse, verse by verse. And so if you have any specific question, I would recommend that you read ahead and then write the question down. Or if you think of it afterwards, write it down and bring it up the next time. Or if you think of it during the lesson, stop me before I get going too far, okay? So Proverbs 11.1, 1. a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but just weights is his delight. And the idea here is they used to, um, when they were selling, ma making transactions or anything like that, they, they do it by trade uh, according to, to weights and, and things would equal, you know what I mean, like certain amount of gold, for instance, would equal a certain amount of, you know, produce. And so uh, they use these scales in order to judge fairly what something was, was worth. Um, and so what sometimes people would do is shopkeepers would rig their scales um, so that they could have to give less but get more. Yeah. You know? And so this is kind of what he's talking about here. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble uh, is wisdom. And obviously this one's kind of simple. Pride causes us to do dumb stuff. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. When we get prideful, we do dumb things. You know, we don't think things through because we think that we know it all. You know, um... But with the humble is wisdom. You keep yourself from doing stupid things when you're not prideful. Verse 3, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroy them. And this is an idea that's throughout this chapter and the next too. Uh, we are being steered in life by who, by who we decide to be. You know what I mean? Um, sometimes we have this culture in us, not our culture around us, the culture in us. My culture, Michael's culture, Zach's culture, you know, the culture of us, um, where we're not always um, – we understand things a certain way, and we kind of are okay with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we just don't want to – don't want anybody to rock the boat. And the integrity of the upright guides them, but the crookedness of the treacherous destroys them, this idea of ongoing. Verse 4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. This one uh, I don't have a note for, but honestly, this is one of my favorites of this verse. Um, the other one, we'll get to it in a second, but the pig snout <laughs> in verse 22. We'll get to it in just a second. But, uh, basically, the idea is this, um, that you can accumulate all the wealth that you want, but when all, when all things are said and done at the end, it's not going to matter. It's not going to profit you at all. But righteousness delivers from death. It keeps you from that. Um, verse 5, the righteousness of the blameless keeps his way straight, but the wicked falls by his own wickedness. So once again, this goes back to that verse in verse 3, the integrity of that bright guides them. Same thing in verse um, uh, verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 5. The righteousness of the blameless keeps his, keeps his way straight. The, the idea that you act according to what's in your heart. You know what I mean? Jesus said it like this. Um, you take from what's in the house, you know, the, 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 I forget how he says it, but basically the good man takes from his good and the wicked man takes from his wicked because that's what's in his storehouse, you know, so he's able to produce what he has. And that's basically what he's saying here, that we act according to what's in us. Um, verse six, the righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. This kind of goes hand in hand, but it's slightly different. If you notice, the idea here is that wicked people are always giving themselves over to their to their lusts. So in a way, it captures them, and it it, it, it keeps them bound where they can't escape. The the one who gives into lust, they become come over obsessed with lust, and they can't break free from it. It becomes a lifelong addiction that, that they have to deal with. See what I mean? Those who are greedy, it becomes a lifelong addiction for them. Those who are prideful, it becomes a life. See what I mean? And so in that sense, the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. Um, and oftentimes you see people who are, you know, let's say greedy for gain, 
you know, and then they get involved in a business, and then you find out later that they, you know, embezzled money or they uh, lied on their on their taxes or you know what I mean, because their their greed caught up to them, and that's the idea here that the expectation. I'm sorry, that the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. Verse seven: When the wicked dies, his hope will perish, and the expectation of wealth perishes too. So the idea here is that death comes for all, but wicked act foolishly with what they have. When the wicked dies, his hope will perish, and the expectation of wealth perishes too. The uh, wicked people base their life on the immediate pleasure, so once they're gone, there's no lasting effect of it. So obviously we see from these verses here that wealth has temporary usefulness. Um, and also, uh, oftentimes he talks about the uh, righteous people becoming wealthy or, or getting rewarded. He's not talking about rich in sense of um, physical wealth, but in sense of lasting wealth. So keep that in mind because all throughout Proverbs, the, the, the focus is this, that, that things are to be used wisely, but they are not the last say-so. They're just a tool. You know, and so it, does the Bible teach that Christians can't be wealthy? No, but it does teach that they should be wise with their wealth. Um, verse eight: The righteous is delivered from trouble, and the wicked walks into it instead. Um, and this is something we're going to look at in a few verses later. So I'm not really going to look at it right now. But there's this idea that 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 when when you walk according to righteousness, your foot is kind of withheld from that way because you don't go that way. See what I mean? It's kind of like um, let me think of a way to, an example. Um, the righteous person says, "Hey, I'm not going to cheat on my spouse because this is going to end up poorly." But the wicked person walks right into it, and they they go ahead and cheat on their spouse, and then their spouse finds out, finds out, and everything blows up in their face. See what I mean? It's just an example. Um, verse nine: With his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. And here throughout, through the rest of the verse, you, there's going to be a, a couple different times he talks about what people say. But this is one of the, uh, kind of the, the, the beginning of, of those little parts that he says. And if you notice what he says, with his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. This is the idea of gossip, of complaining, of, of talking against someone, of spreading ba bad rumors, of, of lying about somebody. With his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor. But by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. Um... Verse 10, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. Did I say that right? It goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices, and when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. Um, and so this is kind of the idea that he mentioned in verse, uh, I mean, in chapter 10, when he was talking about, um, you know, how wisdom is the basis. No, that was probably chapter 8 or 9. He was talking about wisdom being the basis of, of kings. This is kind of what he was talking about, the fact that a stable society is built on wisdom. Um, if... Uh, like in verse 10, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. If this isn't something that's happening, it shows that the society is, is somewhat upside down. Um, when, when, when evil is, is glorified and righteous are, are condemned, you know, you, you see uh, problems start to develop. Um, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. And when the wicked perish, there are shouts of gladness. The idea that a stable society is built on wisdom. Um, so then these next three verses we're going to look at together, 11, 12, and 13. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but by the mouth of the wicked it is overthrown. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets, but he who is trustworthy in, in spirit keeps a thing covered. Now here, like I said, it's talking about our, our mouths, and, and it actually has a few different things from a few different angles. Well, first, let's look at verse 11. By the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted. So the first idea here is that as Christians, we need to be doing things that help our city, that reach our city. See what I mean? The righteous people need to be blessing the city. Not just with a verbal blessing, but in the things that we say, we don't need to be talking bad about the police officers, about the firemen, about the, the, the people on the, on the city uh, board. I'm not saying we have to be blind to, to corruption, but we need to make sure that we're, we're seeking the blessing of the city and not the, not the curse of it. Um, but then, but by the mouth of the wicked, it is overthrown. The idea that wicked people are, are disastrous for a city, for righteous people are, are something that, that holds it together. Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. So this would be some, a good example of this is if you hear somebody talking bad about somebody and you, you join in and making fun of the person. Not that we've ever done that, right? Um, when your neighbor does something dumb and so you, you talk bad about what he did behind, your back, behind his back. Uh, when... Um, 
when you get in an open tiff with your neighbor and badmouth them to their face. <laughs> Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense. It's just, it's not going to go well. But a man of understanding remains silent. See, once again, wise people are marked by their ability to close their mouth. Not their ability to say the perfect thing, by their ability to close their mouth. Whoever go, did, hey, did that come up this week at all? Did you guys have any opportunity this, this week to keep your mouth silent rather than shooting it off? Yeah. Yeah? yeah remember that lesson last week, and again, here it is in verse 11 again. Huh. Wise people remain silent in those situations. Verse 13, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. But he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. And remember what we were talking about last week. We talked about that when, when a wicked person is angry with someone, how they'll, they'll, they'll pretend like they're not. That's not what he's talking about here. Here he's talking about being trustworthy. Somebody does something and you don't blab it to everybody. You try and bring peace to the situation. You know what I mean? Um... Or uh, somebody somebody wrongs you and you just decide to you just decide to let it go and forgive them. See what I mean? Um, whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. They're, they're not trustworthy. But he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. That takes us to uh, on to verse uh, thirteen. Whoever goes about slandering reveals. I'm sorry, that was the verse I just ended on, verse fourteen. Where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors there is safety. This is something that, that isn't just true of a nation, of, uh, of leaders of nations. This is true of people and individuals, too, of churches. When there is no guidance, a people falls. People talk about those real spiritual churches that don't have pastors or prepared sermons. They just go as the Spirit leads. Where there is no guidance, a people falls. <laughs> what about those people who can't be told what to do, so they start their own house churches? Where there is no guidance, a people falls. <laughs> See, I mean, this is something that applies in a lot of things, politically, spiritually. Um, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. And there's this idea that sometimes we make decisions that really aren't the best decisions, huh? So verse uh, 15 here. Wh uh, whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer harm. But he who hates striking hands and pledges secure. And did you notice the contrast there? It says, whoever puts up security for a stranger, not just for a person, for a stranger, uh, will surely suffer on. But he who hates striking hands and pledges secure. Complete opposites here. Contrast of foolishly joining anyone versus never joining. And the idea here, I'm not going to say that there's no good example as to why, no good example of, of when to when to co-sign on a loan, for instance. I'm not going to say that there's no such no such. That there is no good example. But I'm going to say, I have yet to see a good example. And if there is a good example, it's probably few and far between. So as a general rule, he's contrasting the idea of foolishness with just anybody. Hey, hey, stranger, you want me to co-sign on your loan? Versus, you know, being wise with your money. Whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer harm. But he who hates striking hands and pledge. Not that you never do, but the idea that you do it very, very grudgingly. <laughs> you know what I mean? And by grudgingly, I don't mean with a bad attitude. I mean sparingly. Sparingly. So always be wise with that. In, in your whole lifetime, you should you should strike hands and pledge one to maybe maybe tops of one or two times in your entire life. No more than that. The ideal is that you never strike hands and pledge. No co-signing of loans. That's the ideal. However, there may be an excuse for once. If you are coming to the to a point in your life where you're getting ready to to do it like for a second or a third time. No, you're 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 you probably shouldn't be doing this. And if you're around like seven or eight times, you're really not in a good place financially. Um, verse sixteen: A gracious woman gets honor, and and violent men gets riches. Now this sounds like it's condemning. I mean, it sounds like it's condoning violence, doesn't it? But it's really not, though. Um, women are were oftentimes overlooked in the society. Remember, they're not they're not they're just they're just women, right? This is a very male-dominated dominated culture that this was written in, and women just weren't that big, weren't that important in there. So he starts off with saying, "A gracious woman gets honor." Excuse me. And then uh, the man, a violent man, gets riches. The idea here is that honor is better than riches, and to be kind is better than to be feared. See, if a woman who who isn't even looked at with, with high honor in society gets honor. By her, by her graciousness and by her kindness, how much more so should a man do it? See what I mean? 
And uh, once again, he's not condoning the violence of the man. He's just saying that that's how men tend to get riches is through their violence. Um, so, verse 17, a man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. That one, I, I don't really feel like there's that need of any explanation. Um, the wicked earns deceptive wages, but one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. The idea is, is this. If you do what's right, you may be mistreated in life, but you know what your reward is. If you do something wicked, you may actually believe that the thing you're getting is a, is a reward. I was paid to assassinate this person. I was paid to do this, and this is a good thing. But it's deceptive because it fools the person into thinking that, that it, it's, it's good wages. It fools the person because um, because the wages of this world just have a way of obscuring our, our focus. There's so many things that could be said about this verse. It's really just a great verse. I would recommend memorizing this verse above and beyond the other verses. Just something for you. The wicked earns deceptive wages, but one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. Wickedness... They work their whole life towards something, and it falls apart in the end because they die. Righteousness, we, we work towards something bigger than ourselves, and in the end, we die. But the righteous thing does not go unrewarded. Um, 19. Whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who pursues evil will die. And uh, So here, obviously, we have another contrast. The idea of steadfast in righteousness... Persevering and doing the right thing versus pursuing evil. If you notice, there really was no gray area in these verses, was there? If you're, if you're good most of the time or if you're bad most of the time, no, no. He says, is steadfast in righteousness or is pursuing evil? Really, two, two, it's two stark contrasts here. And the idea is that uh, – the idea is that um, – sorry, I got distracted there. Uh, righteousness, there's no such thing as perfection, right, in righteousness, but you're pursuing something. You're persevering in it. People mistreat you, you're persevering in it. But with, but with wickedness, it's not that you did something wrong once as a righteous person. It's that you pursue wickedness. So what about somebody who's not saved, but they're a good person? Well, remember, the, the standard of good is, is God. And our best is, 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 is not good enough because God is perfect. You may know somebody who's good in the sense of good and bad in a, in, a, in a relative sense. But God's not concerned with relativity. He's concerned with absolutes. <laughs> and God makes us righteous. See? So, uh, 20, those of crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. Uh, once again, the idea of, of our inward being, whether it, whether it is set on evil, which is which the Lord is, is very much opposed to so much uh, – and contrasted with uh, blameless, doing things, um, well, just keeping your way from, from doing what's wrong. Um, and notice that though the uh, the validation there, abomination to the Lord versus delight of the Lord. So uh, it takes us to verse 21. Be assured an evil person will not go unpunished, but the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. The idea here is that righteousness is a lasting blessing and that God guides the children of the righteous because of their righteousness. So that's kind of a kind of a, a, a big statement there. When we're righteous, we're righteous not just for our kids, but for our kids and our grandkids. Sorry, not just for our own sake, but for our kids and our grandkids. Um, but when we're wicked, look at this, an evil person will not go unpunished. Does that mean that we forever have to bear the, the harms of, of our parents? Ezekiel said it like this. Don't You have this proverb that you say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and, and the children's uh, teeth are set on edge. And he said, don't say this anymore. Why they were saying this was, oh, we're being punished. We've been sent into exile because of what our fathers did. And what I, e e Ezekiel was saying was, no, 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 don't say that anymore. You need to, tur need to turn and repent to God. You, not your parents. And uh, so anyways, verse 22, like a gold ring and a pig snout. This one's one of my favorite. Is a beautiful woman without discretion. <laughs> <sighs> let's go that let's just read that one again. Can I get an amen? Like a gold ring and a pig snout is a beautiful one without discretion. <laughs> oh man, I like that one. <laughs> There's just some of these that, that make me laugh. Eh? That was one. 
Do it. Garbage. <laughs> <laughs> the desire of the righteous ends only in good. The expectation of the wicked in wrath. Remember, the wicked are are, 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 bound, are guided around by desires, by lust, those kinds of things. But they don't see they don't see their hope fulfilled, and when their expectations are brought to brought to conclusion, it brings about bad things. Notice how he said in verse I mean in the earlier chapters when he was warning about adultery, how um, how the not to cheat because the the husband wouldn't be forgiving. Remember I was talking about that. So here we have that brought up again. The expectation of the wicked in wrath. See the wicked cheat and they ex expect something good, but it results only in wrath. Not only that, but uh, wickedness brings wickedness. So verse 24, even if it wasn't God or right, it was a good thing. Um, that was for verse 23. Um, if you notice what, what I was getting at with this, I didn't really mention it, but since it's in the notes, I will. Um, the desire of the righteous ends only in good. The idea is that... <laughs> kids, kids, kids. The idea is that um, <laughs> with righteousness... <laughs> There, see, now that she got over there, now she stopped. <laughs> she just wants to be coddled, huh? Um, the idea is that, uh, that I was going for on this note is that when righteous people want to do something good, it's not necessarily that um, it's, the, it's the right thing to do or it's something that, that, that God wanted them to do, um, but it was nevertheless a good thing. You know what I mean? Like, for instance, I'll give you an example because that might sound a little bit obscure. David wanted to build God a, a temple. And so he went to, went to a prophet and he said, hey, I'm going to do this thing. And the prophet said, oh, that's a, that's a good thing. Not necessarily the right thing or God's thing, but a good thing. So he said, okay, yeah, go and do that. But then when the prophet led, left, God told him go back and tell him not to do it. His son's going to do it because he's killed too many people. There's too much bloodshed. Um... And so that's a good example of a good thing. It wasn't necessarily the right thing for David to do, but it was a good thing for David to do. David was trying to do a good thing. And that's why I'm saying when our heart is set on God instead of our selfish desires, when it's set on doing a, the good thing for God, we will make mistakes. But hopefully the idea is that our decisions will be based off of what is good um, rather than what is wicked. Like working at Walmart. What a wicked thing. It's not going to be a thing after... <laughs> it's his last day at Walmart. Uh, yay. <laughs> right? Um, one gives freely, it grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers one. And the idea here is that greedy people always want more. And people who give try, find true happiness. And that's the idea here. And, and notice the, just the complete absurdity of it. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers one. See, in, in, in earthly wealth, that doesn't make sense. If we're with, withholding our wealth from others, that should mean that we're getting richer. But this is the exact opposite. And there's the idea of greed that we looked at before. So, mm -hmm. Boop. Cheating and worrying only makes you suffer. It's a mindset. It's, it's your outlook on life. And... Uh, Sometimes we cheat to get ahead. Sometimes we worry about our finances. We're making ourselves suffer when we do these things. We think that we're that we're you know oh I, I'm just keeping a good eye. I'm just you know getting ahead. You're just causing yourself harm. Um, and it's all about the mindset there. Rich people aren't satisfied with their wealth. Poor people aren't satisfied with their lack of wealth. So what's what needs to change? The mindset. The mindset needs to change. Uh, verse 25, whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. Now, the idea here isn't doing something for the sake of being blessed, because that's not really blessing somebody. The idea here is that doing right yields a good profit. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. It's like this. When, when, when a pastor tries to uh, tries to only work, you know, 35 to 40 hours a week, and, and he doesn't love his people, and you know he's just very distant with people. He's got he's got his, his office in order, and did, you know what I mean? Pastor, if you know anything about pastor, he's never in his office. A lot of people have gotten mad because he's never in his office. Why is he never in his office? Because he's out serving people. See the contrast there? <laughs> so that, once again, going back to this, um, whoever brings blessing will be enriched. One who waters will be himself be watered. 
Okay, was there anything else I wanted to say? Verse 26, the people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. Um, and the idea here is that um, when you hold back grain, uh, you drive up you drive you drive up prices because you're not selling it, so people have to pay more for what there is to sell. See what I mean? But when you when you sell, uh, when you when you uh, when you sell it, it keeps the cost down, and everybody has what they need, free exchange. So the idea here is, is the is the bad the driving up prices up is a bad thing. Obviously, I mean, I don't think any of us would disagree with that. Um, verse 27, whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. And, you know, sometimes we fool ourselves with the desires of our heart. Did you know that? Sometimes the desire of our heart will be set on riches or, you know, on, on, on this, that, or the other thing. And that uh, – um, I'm wondering if I should wait or if he's, he's going to – I'll just go ahead and keep going because it's going to be awkward. <laughs> so I'll just plow ahead. Um, whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor um, or success, but evil comes for him who searches for it. Basically the idea uh, – kind of the idea of karma, that the things that we do come back on us, kind of, except – I already talked about this. Karma is unchristian, and it's, it sounds similar, but it's not the same. Um, we'll look at that probably again in the future, um, but kind of, kind of like that. Uh, verse twenty-eight: um, Whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. That one is self-explanatory. We looked at that last week, anyways. Um, whoever troubles his own, his own household will inherit the wind, and the fool will be a servant to the wise of heart. The idea here in the first part is that our family is how we get our inheritance, right? So if you bring Trouble to the thing that's giving you your inheritance, <laughs> you're going to inherit the wind. Whoever troubles his own household will inherit the wind. He does so to his own harm. And the fool will be servant to the wise of heart. Fools can't be told what to do. They always want to go their own way, and as a result, they're always lacking. They're always wanting more. They don't have it. So therefore, they become the servant to the wise, <laughs> who know how to handle their money and know how to handle their household. Uh, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Now, captures souls is not talking about saving people. Okay, we'll look at that in just a second. But I want you to notice the contrast here. The fool who is a servant and, and who inherits the wind versus the fruit of the righteous, a tree of life. Contrast there. Um, the idea of verse 30, whoever captures souls is wise. The idea is that righteous people attract others to wisdom. They're capturing their attention. They're capturing their soul into wisdom. Does that make sense? I'm not talking about saving people in, in the sense of, of Christianity saving people. Okay, I know a lot of people quote this as, as that. That's not what he's talking about at all. <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, verse 31, if the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner? And obviously we talked about this before. Righteous people don't always get good things in life. Sometimes they die young and, and die poor. However... Um, if you know the idea here is kind of a contrast, sometimes righteous people do get what you see. What I mean, what, what they deserve on earth. So how much more will evil people who seem to get what what, uh, what they don't deserve on earth get what they actually deserve, not just in this life but in the next life? Uh, if the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more are the wicked and the sinner? Um, okay, I already said that. Okay, so that takes us to Proverbs 12. Whoever loves discipline. Loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Well, that's pretty blunt. Right. If you listen to what people have to say, you're smart. If you don't, you're an idiot. Oh, okay. All right. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil, device, evil devices he condemns. Once again, the idea of, of God being the one who's doing the, doing the action. A good man obtains favor from the Lord. But a man of evil devices, he condemns. The Lord condemns. No one is established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will never be moved. And the idea here is, have you ever heard of someone leading a mutiny and then having having a secure kingdom? No. They always have to look over their shoulder. They they always have to worry about another mutiny against themselves. You know, same as re rebels, mutineers, the same kind of thing going on there. But then, um, the 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 thing is. When there's a wicked person who acts wicked, 
wickedly, they don't produce something that's long-lasting. See what I mean? They produce something that's short-lived. And it's the same thing. It's the same thing in opposite for the righteous people. They have a root that is not shaken or moved. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. So that takes us to verse four. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. That one's kind of self-explanatory. The thoughts of the righteous are just. Uh, once again, remember that this is a male-dominated society, so the actions of the wife reflected poorly on the man in his household. Remember that. Um, that's not the same thing now, but the principle still applies. That as spouses, spices, spouse. The things that we do reflect on our spouse. <laughs> we'll say spice. The thoughts of the righteous are just, the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. Notice the contrast of the thoughts of the righteous versus the counsel of the wicked. Uh, wicked people are, are, are say things, and it sounds good, but it's kind of just – it's not a good thing. But the righteous people, their thoughts – see what I mean? They don't have wise thoughts on occasion. They have wise <coughs> thoughts because they are righteous, and wisdom dwells with righteousness. Innermost thoughts versus audible thoughts, careful advice. Obviously, you don't want to just take advice from anybody. Um, you know, some of the things you might want to look at. Um, I'll come back to that in a couple weeks. Um, the words of the wicked lie in wait for blood. But the mouth of the upright delivers them. I mean, I, this one's kind of obvious. The idea that, uh, uh, that wicked people can't wait to do bad things. Um, but righteous people deliver people from bad things. Uh, the wicked are – now notice though that they're not – I kind of misread it when I first read it. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, someone else's blood. Okay, But the mouth of the upright delivers them, the other person. Okay, He's not saying the words of the righteous deliver themselves, deliver those other people. Okay, That's not very clear in, in a lot of translations, but – just wanted to clarify that. Anyways, plowing ahead. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. We already talked about this idea of righteousness being a, a um, an inheritance, being something that lasts. A man is commanded, commended according to his good sense, but one who one of twisted mind is despised. You see this with serial killers and stuff like Ted Bundy. I mean, this one's kind of self-explanatory. Better to be lowly and have a servant than to play the great man and lack bread. So what some people do is is they don't actually have, but they want the place of honor, so they pretend to have. And what he's saying is it's better that people don't know that you have, and then you have a servant. You know, some you have hired people. Let's just say let's put it in modern terms. It's better that your business is not known and you have enough money to hire people to do the job than it is to have a, a business that looks great that doesn't get any business. Good enough. Um, what verse was that? Mm -hmm. Ten. Whoever is righteous, whoever is righteous, has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. And the idea here is a contrast. Animals are the least import important in the household, but the righteous person even tends for the for the least important creatures. See, uh, but why is uh, uh, but the but the best that the wicked. Um, can offer is still not good. The mercy of the wicked is cruel. Um, it's not saying that 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 if you take care of animals, you're a good person. He's saying the righteous people even take care of the, take care of his animals. It's an extension. Okay. I know a lot of hippies have turned this into the thing of you know you have to be a tree hugger <laughs> to be righteous, and that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying that the righteous people even take care of the least of their household. Um, Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. And that brings this, and I want you guys to understand this and to remember this. Find a job. Don't look for, for happiness from work. Do not look for, ha for happiness from work because it will never bring you happiness. Work was never meant to give you happiness. Work is to provide. That's it. Okay. You see a lot of people going to, going to college and getting degrees – for things that – because, oh, that's what I wanted to do with my life. 
Who cares about your hopes and dreams? Do not get a job based off your hopes and dreams. Get a job that you can do. And then work on your hopes and dreams apart from your job because your job should not be the fulfillment of your hopes and dreams. That's bad. That means you're living your life for your job. That means you don't have a life. That's a bad thing. That's not a good thing. Listen to what he says in verse 11 again. again. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. Do the job that's there. But he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Well, I want to be a puppeteer, so I got a master's degree in puppeteering. What? <laughs> that's not going to bring home the bread. You're going to get in debt for nothing. See what I mean? Your job should not be the fulfillment of your hopes and dreams. Keep the two separate. Don't get a job to fulfill your hopes and dreams. Get a job that you can do that will pay you. And then go do your hopes and dreams separate. Is everybody understanding this one? Because uh -huh. this one's kind of hidden in this proverb. It kinda, you kind of have to look at it twice before you understand it. Okay, you see people saying, the, saying, saying teaching this a lot. Go, go follow your dreams. Get a job. Get a job you enjoy. Who cares if you enjoy your job? You're not meant to enjoy your job. Work isn't meant to be fun. <laughs> when God said, "Okay, Adam, you sinned, so now you have to work the land," He wasn't saying that's going to be your pride and joy. He's saying it's a curse, not it's a blessing. <laughs> Come on, work is not should, should not be fulfillment. Fulfillment. Your family should fulfill you. Your relationship with God should fulfill you. Those are the things that should fulfill you. Don't make all your whole life about work. Which takes us to verse 12. <clears throat> Whoever is wicked covets the spoils of evildoers, but the root of the righteous bears fruit. The idea that, that wickedness envy wickedness. And it's just there are a few notes that I made. Looking for God to open a door or overlooking. Sometimes God is right in front of us and we're looking for this over the hill thing. You know what I mean? Let's, let me give you an example. There was a guy who needed a job, but um, we gave him three different uh, ideas for a job, even gave him the ability to take him there to, to, to get the job, but it wasn't good enough for him. See, he was looking for God to open up this door, but there was already a door there that he was overlooking for a job. See, and we do the exact same thing. I'm trying to follow my dreams. That's why you don't can't pay your bills, because you're trying to follow your dreams. Get a job, and then follow your dreams apart from your job. It's not that hard of a concept, but so many people are just so misled. And the thing is, is the teachers aren't helping, because the counselors and the, and the school counselors and all that, they're telling the, the high schoolers, follow your dreams. What stupid advice? This is the, You know what America is? It's, it's a, um, um, what's it called? I start with a C. Free trade, trickle down economics. What's that called? Uh, capitalist. Yeah. It's a capital. It's a capitalist country. Okay, that means supply and demand. Somebody needs something, you get the job that they need. You provide the goods, and they pay you for the goods. It's a capitalist government. Works pretty good. The problem is people want to go do something that there is no demand for, and then they want to get paid for doing something that there's no demand for. Well, that's not capitalism. That's socialism. You want somebody to tell you what to do, and for everybody else, you just have to pay for it. Well, I'm a doctor, and the government is making you pay for your health insurance. So now, my do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. To where the government enforces you paying for their job. You know what I mean? Well, that's not capitalism anymore. Capitalism is founded on the idea of free trade. And the idea is that somebody sees a need so that they create a business like Walmart. Right? And then Walmart turns bigger and bigger because it supplied the need that people had. And then trickle down economics. People then get a job at Walmart and they can pay for their stuff now. Uh -huh. Trickle down economics. That's how capitalism works. But what people want to do is they, they want to try and, and get whatever the, the job of their dreams, which there's no, no demand for, right. or an over demand for. Like, how many, how many veterinarians do we have in, in Alberta? It's like, okay, no more veterinarians, please. Right, but an over-demand of them, see what I mean? Well, I'm following my dreams. Yeah, but there's no, there's no, more, there's no longer demand for it. It's gone. The demand is gone. <laughs> Anyways, uh, verse 12. <clears throat> Actually, though, around here with all the animal nuts. There might still be, huh? There might, there might still be. <laughs> Whoever is wicked covets the spoils of evil, Jews. We looked at this one. An evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips. 
but the righteous escapes from trouble. That one's, I mean, pretty, pretty simple, though. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention this. Uh, in verse 12, righteous don't lust after evil ways. Wisdom fulfills the righteous. Um, but anyways, going back to verse uh, 13. Um, the idea that evil evil people, they lie and stuff, and it, ca it catches them in, in their own wickedness. Uh, verse 14, from the fruit of his mouth, a man is satisfied with good. Excuse me. And the work of a man's hand comes back to him. And this is more of just a general observation. From the fruit of his mouth, a man is satisfied with good. You say and do good things, you're going to probably reap a, a reward of, of good, and, right? If I talk behind Chuck's back... Well, something bad might come of that, but if I don't talk bad behind Chuck's back, then I'm going to reap that, right? So, um, the work of a man's hand comes back to him. If you don't plant your seeds, you're not going to have a harvest. I mean, it's pretty simple observations here. Uh, verse 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Obviously, you don't think you're doing something wrong or you wouldn't do it. One time there was somebody who was doing something kind of I, I thought was was foolish, so I, I went to talk to them about it, and they said, I don't think I do that. Obviously, you don't think that you're doing something wrong or you wouldn't be doing it. You see what I mean? If somebody tells you something, oh, I just don't, I don't think that I do that. Well, hold on. Before you instantly turn defensive, stop and think for a minute. Do you, though? Because it might be hidden from you. See what I mean? Sometimes you do things. And you don't realize that you're doing it. Sometimes your close friends do things, and you and you don't realize that your close friend is doing it, right? Because uh -huh. you're friends. Right. It's easier to see the faults in your enemy, and it's easier to see the faults in a situation if you're new to it. Have you ever gone to a different church and thought, this is what they're doing wrong. If they change this, they'd get more people. Uh -huh. And then you go to your church, and you're like, why don't we get more people? <laughs> have, have you ever done that? Because you get blinded to things, you know. You, 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 fresh eyes can sometimes see things that other people can't. Verse 16, the vexation of a fool is known at once. Or in other words, when a fool gets angry, everybody knows it. They don't hide it. But the prudent ignores an insult. And the idea here isn't that he, he, he didn't hear it. It's that he chooses to turn the other cheek. Okay. Um, now, any questions on that? Okay, verse 17. Whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness utters deceit. And this is kind of a court setting if you think about it. Um, the idea of, of honest people, notice how it says that whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence. Honest evidence. But a false witness utters deceit. Verse 17. Whoever speaks, um, verse 18, sorry, verse 18. Boop. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Again about this. Don't use words to hurt people. You should not be speaking if you're tearing somebody down. You should not be speaking. okay? Because you're doing damage to another person. See what I mean? What did it just say there? Verse, uh, I think it was 18? Yeah. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. Have you ever gotten angry and shot your mouth off? Or use a dirty look. Or use a dirty look. I didn't say that. That was you, Diana. You said it. Uh, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Brings healing. Remember that, guys. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is, is but for a moment. And the idea of this is you lose credibility when you lie. People... Stop trusting in you. Deceit, um, verse 20, deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but those who plan peace have joy. No, uh, Verse 21, no ill befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble. And obviously he's not talking about problems. Righteous people have problems. But he's talking about righteousness doesn't give a reward of, of, of ill. Um, in contrast, though, Wicked are filled with troubles. They go to sleep, they have inner inner turmoil, turmoil. They have outer strife. Uh, verse twenty two: Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are His delight. Notice how acting faithfully is in contrast to lying. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims folly. Did you hear what he just said? A prudent man, a, a wise, a discerning person. 
conceals knowledge. In other words, they close their mouth. They don't just throw out wisdom because they're wise. They give it at the right time to the right people, right? Like Jesus was talking about. We'll take a look at that later. But the heart of fools proclaims folly. His innermost being proclaims it. It doesn't just come out of his mouth. It comes out of his facial expressions, right? <laughs> out, out, out of the uh, the tone of his voice. You know, it, it's it's everything about him. His acts, everything he does, it just comes out of his heart. Um, verse 24. The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. If, if you get up and get her done, it'll get done. If you don't, you'll be lacking. I mean, it's a simple concept, you know. That you will either be the greeter at Walmart for the rest of your life, or you'll be the manager at Walmart for the rest of your life. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. But a good word makes him glad. Again, about the things that we say um, and, and how it affects people. Uh, but back on 24, I forgot to mention this. Um, the idea of working hard. Work hard, basically, is verse 24. <laughs> so, verse 25, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. The idea that, you know, sometimes when people struggle, when what do people do when they sin again after they promised God that they would never do it again? Just sin again. No, I mean, oh. when they sin again, what do they do? You know, they, they guilt trip themselves, right? They, they feel all bad, right? So we can say that this verse obviously applies to that. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. But a good word makes him glad. Now, what is he saying here? He's saying this. When people are going through struggles, problems, whatever, they don't need you to, to say something to tear them down. Give a good word, and it'll lift them up. Their anxiety is already weighing them down. Their anguish, their depression, their sorrow, their anxiety, it's already weighing them down. Your job is to give them a good word. See, it, it, I, I swear, we read these verses over and over again, but sometimes we just miss the obvious. Anxiety in man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. A good word from who? From himself? Well, obviously not. From another. <laughs> so, verse 26, one who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor. Uh, an alternate reading, uh, uh, there's some controversy on, on how this verse should be translated. The alternate reading of this is, the righteous chooses his friends carefully. Now, it could be translated either way, depending on which manuscripts are the correct ones. Uh, but I think it's worth looking at both of them, because I think both of them are biblical. So let's look at the first one. One who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor. The, things that, the idea that the things that you do are affecting people. You are a guide to people. And then the second, the second, uh, the alternate reading: the righteous chooses his friends carefully. Exactly what Paul said. <laughs> you know, be smart with who you surround yourselves with. Uh, but then the second part of that verse: but the way of the wicked leads them astray. See, whereas the the righteous people are either, if it's the first translation, either the righteous people um, are helping other people, or they're making sure that they're not ensnared by other people. The wicked people, in contrast to that, um, are leading. Um, are leading people astray. I'm sorry, are leading themselves away. Uh, verse 27, whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get his precious wealth. Wow, this is a principle. The deeper principle is this, that pe lazy people start something, but they don't finish it. They always have a to-do list around their house because they never finish it, because they're lazy. Um, they'll they'll uh, start cooking their meal and they won't finish it. They'll go out and buy this stuff, but they'll never actually cook the stuff and it'll go bad in the fridge. They'll uh, now I'm not saying if your food goes bad in the fridge, you're a terrible <laughs> lazy person. That's not what I'm saying. Sometimes we just misplace food, especially if you have, if you have multiple pe families using the same fridge. But um, I'm more talking about when they go out and they shop and they're like, okay, I'm gonna eat healthy, so I bought all this stuff and they put it in their fridge and it just sits there and rots. Um, College kids do this, you know, when they put something in the microwave and then at four in the morning they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So whoever slothful will not roast his game. The idea that he, he he went hunting, he got the game, he just didn't cook it. So now it's wasted. But the diligent man will get precious wealth. And once again here, the idea of. Um, oh, and also uh, there's an alternate reading of this one too. Diligence is precious wealth is alternate reading. So if you do that, then the diligence would be the precious wealth. However, uh, most of your translations are going to say, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. 
And the idea of this is that it'll be something that, that's lasting. Once again, the contrast of the wicked having a short-lived reign with the wicked having a long-term effect. Verse 28, in the path of the righteous is life, and in his pathway there is no death. That one's pretty self-explanatory too. So we're going to stop there. Any questions on Proverbs 11 or 12? It might do you guys good to read ahead and come up with any questions to ask. Okay. Uh, any, so there's no questions or comments for tonight? We're good to stop? Awesome.